Hello and welcome to the Forum. I'm John Madison. Uh, this is the first episode of a new show that's based uh, on one I had on CTV a few years ago called Between the Lines. In the time since then, I've been trying to study and understand why South Africa's economy failed to grow in the 25 years uh, we've been a democracy and why we're not creating the jobs we need to create. That work was started before the pandemic, but COVID-19 hasn't changed our problems so much as made changes more urgent. The trends were already there. The economy wasn't making it. Government hasn't found the solutions that all stakeholders buy into, that equally satisfy the public interest and investors. We need a government that is mo both more capable and more focused so that where there's waste, that waste is stopped immediately and not left to drag on. We all know if you're in a hole, the first thing to do is to stop digging. Whatever we were doing, whatever problem solving we did was not solving this one core problem, adding enough jobs to meet the population rise, let alone cut unemployment. Uh, this problem and the rise of inequality have become so serious that we could lose everything. We could lose our democracy and our sovereignty. So the forum is an optimistic show, but based on, uh, on an honest search for real solutions um, uh, to face up to what we've screwed up and to fix it. We're also going to keep an eye on other countries in these strange times, especially the election taking place in America in less than two months, uh, where there's a choice between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. That election will have consequences for the whole world. It's being studied microscopically in Berlin, in Moscow, in Chwani, in London, Beijing, in Tokyo, Cairo, and Abuja. And it has implications for all of us. On today's show, I'll be talking to a representative of what's left of the good African National Congress. We'll talk to a woman who has examined how one sector of our economy went wrong. And we'll talk to two Americans who worked in senior positions in the American government decided they'd rather come and live in South Africa instead. But my first guest is someone you, sh you may not know, but you should. Oscar von Heerden is one of those people inside the ANC who writes the resolutions, who counts the votes, who knows all the leaders, and yet he's managed to stay an honest man. Perhaps it helped that Oscar has an education most of us can only look on with admiration and maybe even a little bit of envy. He started his university career at Turfloop, the University of the North, uh, but he went on to Cambridge in the United Kingdom where he did both a master's and a doctorate. Oscar re recently published another one of his books called Two Minutes to Midnight, which tells us about what was the, going on inside Nazrek where Na uh, Saul Ramaphosa narrowly beat Nkosazana Dlamini Zuma to become president of the ANC and therefore, of course, of South Africa. Oscar, a very warm welcome to the forum. Thanks, John. Thanks, Olivia. Um, Oscar, could you, um, uh, you know, I read your book online because of the lockdown, so I don't have a physical copy. Could you just show it to the camera so people can see the cover? Sure. Oh, Two okay. minutes to midnight. Will Ramaphosa's ANC survive? Now, th thanks, Oscar. Now, I, I learned a lot of things from your book, and we're not going to go into too many of them here. Uh, for, that's for people to read. But one of the stories in your book that really I can't resist asking you about is the story you tell of Cyril Ramaphosa during NASREC realizing that he was being bugged by the state security agency and what he did about it. No, absolutely. Uh, you know, he... He had uh, these uh, information sessions at the end of each day and was uh, informed that indeed the state security agency had a caravan uh, parked on the premise, on the Nazrek showgrounds, and it was precisely to try and listen in, uh, jam and frustrate some of uh, those supporters that actually were on the part of the CR-17 campaign. And the, president, uh, the president simply listened attentively, um, never, never expressed an opinion until the very next morning when, as you know, John, he goes on his early morning walks um, and everyone thought it's just another one of those 
Uh, instead, he had other plans. He, he walked on the facility and uh, simply made a detour and, and decided to actually enter this, uh, this caravan and asked all kinds of uncomfortable questions. What so is this he knocked on the door of the caravan and walked in? And simply walked in. Oh, and who are you guys? And what do you do? And what does this button do? And what does this do? And they were so uncomfortable, I'm told, that uh, soon after the president left and continued on his walk, within, within a half an hour, the caravan packed up and was never to be seen again and left the showground. Um, and that was the kind of, that's the kind of thing that Cyril does. You know, he doesn't always tell you what's his intent. Um, but, the but it's such a revealing story because it shows that, I mean, he was the deputy president of the country, and yet uh, under Zuma, the uh, state security agency was was bugging him and interfering with the, the, the politics of, of of a political party. Absolutely. I mean, you know, this this is this is common cause. Uh, we know, for example, I also say in the book that months prior to Nazrik. Um, under very suspicious circumstances, a large sum of money uh, is stolen from the state security agency. People literally just walked on what is commonly referred to as the farm um, and just took all this foreign currency amounting to tens of millions of rand, um, never to be seen or to be found. Um, and I make the link to say that it's quite evident for me that uh, that was money that was going towards the war chest of the Gramini uh, Zuma campaign. But, but they haven't been able to prove that. So we sit with other elegant, yeah. yeah. Um, you also, uh, I just- but, but you know, John, um, they haven't been able to prove it. And of course, as you know, these are all speculation. It's quite, uh, it's quite fresh for, for former President Zuma to want to make all kinds of allegations uh, surrounding the CR17 campaign and how the campaign obtained their, their funding and their money, when in fact we all know, and I make this bold statement in the book, that uh, the, the NDZ camp actually got their money through crooked tenders, uh, raiding of the public purse, stealing of money, and so forth. Um, in order to, to finance the campaign. We found mayors and all kinds of uh, leaders within the provinces with bootloads of money not being able to explain to us what this money was intended for. And this is how, unfortunately, uh, rotten the membership system within the ANC is and the branches. Yes, you, you talk a lot about the, you know, uh, what's gone wrong in the ANC, the brown envelopes, even killing. Uh, uh, between ANC officials, but of course that's got to be proved. We have to get cases out of that, otherwise it's just left hanging in the, and, and nothing is, is, is confirmed. I want to just ask you one other thing from the book. Uh, I, you s suggest that um, uh, President Zuma attempted or would have attempted to use the military to stay in power? Yes, indeed. You know, as, as it was now clear that the NDZ camp had lost, um, and of course, we all knew that there were going to be consequences, a knock-on effect, uh, one of which obviously would be that uh, since there's still an entire year, uh, or actually two years towards the general election, it would not be advisable for President Zuma to remain in high office. Um, and so the necessary moves were being made to ensure that he potentially does the right thing and the honorable thing, which is to resign and to move aside um, so that we don't have this contestation of two centers of power. Now, of course, during the Mbeki administration, as you know, John, um, Mbeki waited patiently for the outcome of the National Executive Committee uh, to sleep and uh, in the early hours of the following day was met by Gwede and Khalima Motrante and others to be informed that he has been asked to be recalled and step aside and he simply made one request which was to address both houses of parliament and do it properly within the confines of the constitution. Now of course Zuma on the other hand facing a similar 
situation where he is now being threatened with a recall, um, actually wanted to hold on to power. And news uh, reports at the time suggesting that he had meetings with the top brass of the military to try and imply that what the ANC NEC was trying to do was tantamount to a coup and that he wanted them to defend him uh, and uphold the, the constitution to which they obviously responded. And this is a sign of the strength of our democracy that they are not here to protect the presidency. They are here to uphold the constitution. And given the representation system that we have, if the party decides it's time for you to go, then they don't have a say as to whether that is the case or not. And so they did not want to. So the generals made it very clear there was no debate. It's not going to happen. Absolutely. Very clear that they are here to uphold the constitution. We're running low on time, and I, don't, I do want to ask you something else that's always intrigued me. Uh, I mean, I understand in Zuma's time that uh, the whole cabinet and many other levels of the ANC were requested, in some cases even required, to go for training in China. And I was intrigued to see that you, you did go for training in China and I, I, as an ANC official. And I wanted to ask you, uh, well, two, two related questions. What did they teach you? And why, you know, because it's, to me it's amazing that China has done something no other, uh, more uh, uh, powerful than any other country in history, the kind of economic reform and growth they've pulled off since 1979. So what did you learn in China and why is what was taught in China not leading to a more Chinese style success story in South Africa? Yes. Well, you know, the, the party, as you know, John, uh, historically, even during the exile days, the ANC had very strong ties with not only uh, the Soviet Union, but also with Vietnam and with China, uh, the Cubans and so forth. And I think that's something that has been going on and that those relations have been kept. And so the, by and large, the delegations that are being sent from the ANC to China is one to learn about their understanding of democratic practices, because there is the charge internationally that China is not very democratic, it's not in keeping with human rights and so forth. And so to a large extent is a fact finding to go and see for ourselves as to whether that is indeed the case, but also to, to understand from the Chinese what's their understanding of democracy and the will of the people. And so we attend these uh, university-like lectures um, from very learned professors uh, from Yale, Princeton, Cambridge and others, um, Chinese professors, who would then give us their understanding of democracy. And, and, and if you allow me very quickly, just to explain, what they're really saying is that democracy as we know it consists of two elements. The one is a practical component and the other a theoretical one. Practical in the sense that you must have five yearly elections, you must have a government, a, a judiciary, and all those kinds of practical things. And then of course, theoretically, Democracy, as far as they're concerned, talks about individualism, a people that are happy, a people don't, that don't feel oppressed, uh, and so on and so forth. And they charge that they subscribe to the theoretical understanding of democracy. They don't agree with the practical. We're running out of time, but I do want to just ask you one follow-up before, before we, we run out of time completely. Um, so it's more about politics and not as much about, I mean, because what impresses me so much about the Chinese, even in the Chinese Communist Party, is that they hold people accountable. They promote and demote on merit. And that's not something we've been able to translate in South Africa. This, in fact, you are absolutely right, John. This is, in fact, one of the lessons I brought back in my report to the Deputy Secretary, Jesse Park, in which I said the manner in which the Chinese Communist Party deals with corruption, not only in government, but in the party, there is much to be learned from the Chinese. As you know, uh, you know I, I, I wrote a, a Daily Maverick article in which I say that the translator was finding it difficult to explain to us that once officials are caught and tried very quickly and found guilty, um, then they are simply shot. 
Oh, yes. Oh, yes. No, no, no. There's, there's no uh, two ways about it. You've been found guilty. All the evidence proved that you have been corrupt. You have brought the, the party and government into disrepute. And so you are taken outside. And the translator, to quote directly, says, we shoot you dead. I'd, I'd, I'd love to carry on on that, but I've got to ask you a last question about where you, what you think is going to happen to the ANC. I'm afraid we only have about 45 seconds, but is the, is the ANC going to, going to survive? Is it going to split? And, and also, critically, is it going to be able to introduce stronger leadership? Uh, um, you know, you and I talked a little bit about the quality of the leadership of the Mandiba, Mandela era. Um, uh, can they bring in, is there any chance they'll bring in outside experts into cabinet who are really expert to, to, to fix things that are broken? Yeah, I think that uh, the short answer, John, is that if, if the Ramaphosa leadership proves to work, and the kind of changes that is required is done. In other words, if we arrest and, and bring a halt and a stop to state capture and corruption, not entirely, of course, that's a, a pipe dream, but significantly, then I think the ANC, the ANC will potentially get another mandate from the electorate in 2024. If, however, Ace Mahashule and his cronies, the, the, the corona thieves and the state capture thieves succeed, then I think the ANC will be punished in the next election and possibly will have to begin to engage with coalition talks and so forth. Um, having said that, I think 2029, we are going to see an ANC that splits and uh, hopefully we'll get, uh, we'll, we'll get the separation of the talk from the chief. But you're talking about 10 years between, the, or nine years between now and then. Yeah, I think mm. so. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for doing this, Oscar. Uh, I hope we'll have you again uh, on the show soon. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk to talk, be talking to an expert on tobacco and South Africa's sovereignty. Uh, we'll be right back. Welcome back. My next guest is Talita Snickers. Talita is a former prosecutor, a former um, executive at SARS, the South African Revenue Service, and she's written a new book called Dirty Tobacco, Spies, Lies, and Mega Profits. Um, a SARS insider spills the beans on global crime. The interesting thing about this book is it's not just about South Africa. It's a very well-researched and very readable book, but it really looks at the global tobacco problem and I must say, I was surprised at how much I was surprised. Um, uh, be, first, first of all, the first thing that really surprised me is, um, Tanita, you said that uh, um, cigarettes are more profitable than cocaine, and I think you even said heroin. Absolutely. So cigarettes are now the world's most widely smuggled legal substance. And the reason is it's so profitable. So you can make more than 4,000% profit on a consignment of illicit cigarettes, making it more profitable than literally cocaine, heroin, um, any of the other drugs on the market, um, firearms. So it's, it's the most profitable thing to smuggle. Um, before we get to the, the, the three myths you, uh, that I wanted to ask you about that come out in your book that really did surprise me, uh, I mean, just as background, I, uh, I worked in America when uh, some of my colleagues were working on the story, journalists working on stories about the cigarette business and how the cigarette companies for years had research showing that uh, cigarettes cause cancer. But for many years, they denied it, they concealed it, and they ran PR campaigns uh, denying it. Well, absolutely. You know, so way back in 1973, Philip Morris established um, their Tobacco Research Center. 
And the purpose of that was to try and counter some of the research that had been coming into the public in terms of how dangerous smoking actually was. Um, they came up with some really ludicrous statements, you know, so anything can kill you if you get too much of it. Apple sauce will kill you if you get too much of it. Um, another thing that they tried to convince the public of was that um, lung cancer was caused by drinking too much coffee uh, and not you know, by smoking. We know, for instance, that um, for 42 years, Philip Morris's own internal documents were showing that when um, smokers were smoking their particular brands of cigarettes, they were actually ingesting a number of really dangerous particles. So for 42 years, Philip Morris knew this and just buried um, the evidence. Uh, you know, there's another example, for instance, where um, Kent cigarettes were launched on the market, um, you know, to great fanfare, saying that they were the greatest health, they offered the greatest health protection in the history of cigarettes, because they'd be manufactured using what they called a micronite filter. Well, as it turns out, the micronite filter contained asbestos, um, and so it was killing smokers even faster than without the um, than without the filter. So for the longest time, um, you know, they they've become masters in terms of uh, driving the narrative and trying to pin the blame on somebody else. Um, and, and, and quite cynically manipulating public opinion. Absolutely. You know, I think one of the things that the tobacco companies have been doing extremely well from inception was using public relations companies to advise them in terms of how to craft their messaging, um, how to put their words in other people's you know, mouths, how to use experts to speak on their behalf. Um, because the, the companies themselves know that we're not going to trust a tobacco company. Uh, but if they can get an expert to speak on their behalf, we're more likely to trust them. And so they've become experts at using um, other experts who we think we can trust, uh, you know, to, to give us their view on the tobacco industry. Right. Now, I want to come to the, the myths that for me were the most uh, surprising. The first one was that uh, illicit uh, cigarettes are not the purview of small companies. I assume from reading the media that there are these small companies, the ones we read about in the paper and that are, uh, have some slightly uh, dodgy pol political connections, that they're the ones doing all the smuggling. But you, of course, show uh, that the big companies, including British American Tobacco, much of their product is also involved in smuggling. Well, you know, John, at the beginning, you said you were surprised at how surprised you were when you read the book. And the same, you know, held true for me. So I came across uh, an academic research article that explored how British American tobacco had made as much as 25% of their global profit from smuggling into China. And that's kind of what got me, you know, interested in writing the book. So I think one of the first challenges we have is accepting that big tobacco companies almost have criminality embedded in their DNA. And they have without any doubt been smuggling the world over for decades. The reason why they like pinning illicit trade on their smaller competitors is because these smaller guys are obviously eating into their market share. And so they've really perfected the art of directing our law enforcement agencies. You know, go and dig, uh, you know, in the small guys' warehouse. I'm sure you'll find lots of dirty stuff there because, of course, illicit trade is perpetrated by smaller, low-cost manufacturers and never by, you know, listed multinational companies. Um, but as it turns out, you know, not just in China, but literally the world over, we see um, evidence mounting of big tobacco companies smuggling their own packs. And the reason they do so is very simple. They make the same amount of profit on a smuggled pack as they do on a legal pack. And also, there are many markets around the world where um, tobacco companies would have a hard time, you know, gaining entry into the local marketplace. And so smuggling is one way for them to actually get their product onto a market. But uh, before we, I want to get on to, to the other myths uh, 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 in, a, in a second, but just that uh, you're saying that in some cases the small companies are, are, could be honourable or at least certainly no less honourable than, than the big ones. 
Well, look, I, I think when you speak to anybody who's been looking at the tobacco industry, there are no angels. You know, I don't think I've come across a single tobacco manufacturing company who doesn't have some kind of skeleton in their closet. They all do. But I think what we need to do is to challenge this paradigm that says it's only the small guys who are cheating the system. And instead, to understand that the big tobacco players have as much of an incentive to cheat the system as the, the smaller uh, up and coming breed of tobacco manufacturers do. I'm going to take a quick break. Uh, and when we come back, I want to explore some of the other myths as well as some of the bigger things you've been writing about in Business Day. We'll be right back. And we're back talking to Talita Snickers, author of Dirty Tobacco. Uh, Talita is talking to us from Indonesia, five hours ahead of us. Um, but we, don't, we, we do need to move on. I want to ask you very quickly about the, uh, the next myth, which is that, that the high cost of, of cigarettes is purely a result of government tax. And you say that actually every time government taxes go up, uh, 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 cigarette companies add to their pro profits by putting a huge uh, chunk back o o onto their own um, uh, share, share, of the, share of the take. Absolutely. So, you know, in South Africa, between 1990s and 2000, for every 10 cents that government put the tax up on cigarette packs, the industry increased the retail price by 18 cents. So for every time there was a tax increase, the industry was actually making 8 cents pure profit off the back of a, of a government tax increase. At, at no cost. And the, and the third, uh, the last myth I wanted to ask you to explain very quickly, briefly, is that cigarette companies could do a better job of tracking which packs are, are, are legal and which aren't, but they don't want to. So they put a lot of energy, money and effort into making sure they come up with tracking systems that aren't as good as they could be and aren't as good as they are in, in many other uh, businesses. Absolutely. You know, so the tobacco industry, a company like British American Tobacco will say, we have 350,000 farms that we buy from and we audit them every three years and they go through rigorous supply chain controls. But the minute the cigarettes leave our factory, we have no control over where they go. We can't control the downstream supply chain. But we know, you know, something as innocuous as a tube of toothpaste travels through a much more secure supply chain than cigarettes do. We know that you can buy, you know, a salmon fillet at Woolworths um, and you can actually trace it back to where it was caught on which shipping vessel it was caught. And so it's absolutely preposterous for the tobacco industry to say that they cannot trace their facts once they leave their factories. The simple fact of the matter is that tobacco companies choose not to track where the packs go um, because they very well know that their packs are ending up on the illicit market. I, 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 I'd love to talk more about that, but I'm going to leave that for people to read in, in your book. But I want to go on to, I have two final questions in the short time we have. The one is, um, um, you wrote an article in Business Day, and you make the point that sovereignty is, that I, I suppose you could say that by the time we all debate going to the IMF, the International Monetary Fund would mean losing our sovereignty. But I think you would uh, say that if you have to go to the IMF, you've probably already lost your sovereignty because you weren't keeping, keeping your books. And that's how you lose, lose control of your future as a country. Absolutely. You know, I, I think um, our government has forfeited the right to um, stake a claim to sovereignty because it is being run by captured and corrupt politicians. And so I think the, you know, the IMF for us almost comes as a business rescue practitioner where our debts exceed our income and we are in need of a business rescue practitioner who can save the country and who can help us figure out how to balance the books. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I think it's a very simple proposition to say that government has effectively forfeited the right to, to claim um, that it has sovereignty because you can't claim sovereignty on the one hand and on the other hand be run by capture and corrupt politicians. 
Um, that leads me to my final question, which is uh, I've also been in government for a little bit and got very frustrated. What frustrated you most about being in government and what solution in South Africa and what solutions would you be focused on to fix it? Um, I think that the single most frustrating thing would be when you look at particularly some of the um, elements that that operate under the radar. So let's take excise taxes as an example, you know, so tobacco taxes, fuel taxes, all of these elements seem to operate under the radar. They're not funded well, they don't generate a lot of revenue. And because they don't generate an, a lot of tax revenue, people think that they're not important. In fact, they like, you know, the broken window, the broken glass of, um, where people think, well, you know, we'll cheat on this and so we can cheat on so many other things. So I think the frustration lies in um, people not seeing the bigger picture in terms of, you know, once criminality erodes one part of your system, it's very easy for it to erode the whole system. So it's this inability to see the big picture in terms of what's important, not to simply equate the importance of, of activities in terms of the revenue that they generate, but in terms of a broader view of strategically, where should we as a government focus, where should we as a government agency focus? Talita, I could talk to you much longer, but we're out of time. Thanks so much for doing this with us. The book is Dirty Tobacco, Spies, Lies and, Me and Mega Profits. I, I thoroughly re recommend it. It's very readable and it gives you an insight you won't easily get. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Talita, thanks for, for joining us. I hope we can talk to you again soon. After the break, we're going to talk to two former senior American government officials who both live in South Africa instead. They know a great deal about American politics. Uh, they both dealt with former Vice President Joe Biden, who, who's challenging Donald Trump for the presidency in elections in, in less than 50 days. Uh, we'll be right back. And welcome back. Before we discuss the US election, since this is our first show, I want to play this ad from a group in Donald Trump's Republican Party uh, that are against him and are spending all their time and money and effort uh, in fighting him. And they, they call themselves the Lincoln Project. And, they ha and we're going to show one of their ads so you can just see what Americans are viewing on their television about their president. Just tell me he's okay. Oh, he's gone. Where is he? Where's my baby? I want to see him right now. Harry. No hugging. No hugging, please. I'm not going to hug nobody. Hello. Oh, hey, it's okay. I'm okay. Yeah. It's okay. But the doctors won't tell me anything. Uh, could someone please explain what's going on? Okay, honey. You were in a very bad car accident. Yeah. And you bumped your head. And so about three and a half years have gone by. Three and a half years? Yeah. You were in a coma. Yeah. And now it's 2020. Wow. <laughs> wow. Did, did I miss anything interesting? <clears throat> what? Uh -uh. Uh. Uh, just you guys go. Uh, go ahead. Well, sweetheart, do you remember that our president is Donald Trump? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> we finally got a Republican back. Strong leader, boy. He's a strong leader. Supporting families. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, he's got a bunch of his own family working in the White House right now. Uh -huh. Bless their hearts. And too. as he promised, he's keeping the Mexicans out. So he actually built his wall. Ah, uh, well. He, hey, how do you get Mexico to pay for it? I, I don't think I remember him saying that. And don't mention the kids in the cages. I'm not gonna. Kids? Yeah, I, I gotta admit, that, that didn't turn out the way he said it would. If I remember right, his, his wife was a, a, an immigrant. Oh, yeah. Isn't she pretty? Oh, oh, I just love all her She's dresses. She's from one of those non-shithole countries. Yeah. And she was so strong when she found out that her husband was paying off one of those... Um, Porn stars. Exactly. Uh, a porn star. Oh. 
I guess we did want a, an outsider Republican. Yes, we did. <laughs> did he lose the evangelicals? Actually, no they didn't really say very much. You know, he eventually took a picture in front of a church with a, a upside-down Bible, and that helped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It did. Well, and we have race rats. Race rats? No, more like peaceful, everybody riots. Yeah, everybody good yeah. around. People yeah. in yeah. the street yelling for equal rights for mm -hmm. black people, mm -hmm. again. <laughs> and you know what? I have to admit, I do agree they deserve it because the police keep accidentally killing black people. Well, we can't support that. We're Republicans, not Klansmen. That's kiddo, right. kiddo. You know, they're, they're fine people on both sides. You believe that? I'm trying to. <clears throat> Trump was just making a point about fairness and there being two sides to every story, mm -hmm. especially when one is so terrible. That's right, keep it balanced. Just mm -hmm. like how he got himself impeached. Whoa, impeached? For what? For supposedly cahooting with the, with the Russians. Wow, the Republicans must have crushed him on that Russia stuff. Oh no, my love, they are loyal, good people. Mm -hmm. Well, especially that Mitch O'Connell. I thought we hated the Russians. We do, except we like Putin. Apparently, he turned good. I mean, let's be honest. Trump knew for a very long time that Putin and the Russians were paying off the Taliban's to kill us. Oh, the news networks must be just destroying him. Oh, but honey, we don't listen to them. Oh, oh, we're the scientists. Yeah, it's fake news! Fake, fake news! news. Fake, fake news! Fake news! Fake news. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, did you all become doctors? Why are y'all wearing masks? Well, Pumpkin, there is a virus killing people all over the world. Now, at first, Mr. Trump said it was just a hoax made up by the Democrats, but people kept getting sick. Mm. So then, Trump asked the doctors to figure out a way how to inject disinfectant mm -hmm. into everybody. Mm -hmm. But then finally, Trump took some medicine, although not the real kind, mm -hmm. not the real kind. Mm -hmm. And now, over 150,000 Americans are dead. I mean, nothing could be done about it, right? Excuse me. Uh, how do you know if you have the virus? <laughs> no, you don't. No. <laughs> no. I mean, we can't get tested. The president slowed that way down. But that was so that less people died from it. That's correct. Wait, what? Would you like a mask? Oh, God. Oh, oh honey, no. look at him. Hey, oh, don't, no. don't, don't you worry. The reason we elected him was for, so he could fix the economy. Yeah. That's exactly what mm -hmm. he did, right? He gave huge tax cuts to the rich folk who hire people. Mm -hmm. Oddly, they didn't hire people. Mm -hmm. Millions of people are newly unemployed, mm -hmm. including your father. <laughs> oh, that's me, Mr. Mr. Lose Your Job. Lost my damn job. Do you guys remember how nobody came to his party in Oklahoma? No. Where he's just talking about how he could drink water. Well, he did it, it was well. Like, it was he like did a, do it. Good. It was an assist. You know what, Gary? We should go stay at Mar-a-Lago sometime. I bet we'd meet some oh. big shots. No, we can't afford that, honey. Oh, I forget. You no, know, my favorite, my favorite was that that time um, when in Puerto Rico, uh -huh. when it started raining, oh, right? Yeah. All yeah. Them, so then Trump went down there and he threw them all free paper towels. Oh, that's just right. Chunk and that's exactly paper, paper towels. Towel. And now you can't even find a paper towel. So okay. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know right. what we never did? What? Find out the meaning of kofefi, though. No, I think no. that's kofefi. Kofefi. That's the I, French see, version of right. it. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Millard Arnold and Professor John Stremler. Uh, first, Millard, we met nearly 40 years ago in Washington, D.C. Millard was a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights. We've been friends ever since. Uh, you, you, you had befriended Steve Biko, the black consciousness leader, and since his death, you've edited several books by and about him. I was going to ask you why it's still relevant, but I, we, we're running so tight on time. I'm going to have, have to save that for another program when we get you back, Millard. Uh, but very welcome. Thanks for being on the show.
Thank you, John. Pleased to be here and uh, with your audience. It's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you about the U.S. elections. Our other guest is John Stremler, who since working in the U.S. State Department has had a long association with Wits University in Johannesburg, as well as working for former President Jimmy Carter at his foundation in Atlanta, Georgia. John, welcome to you too. Thank you very much, John. John, I want to first ask you to comment on the ad and give us the context. How does it come about that Republicans are devoting their lives and their money to ending Trump's presidency and elect a Democrat? Well, John, this is a remarkable election in many ways, but the Lincoln Project represents a very small slice of the Republican Party. They are leading Republicans, including one of the founders, George Conway, who's married to um, a woman who's just Kellyanne Conway, who's just stepped down as a very close Trump advisor. So you see that there are divisions within families, within the party, and of course, across the nation. Trump has been a very divisive figure, and we're going to see what happens on November 3rd in terms of reconciling that division or not. Before I go to uh, Millard, I wanted to ask you one thing. You wrote an article in The Conversation recently in which you describe uh, the Trump presidency as state capture. Do you really see it as analogous, this Trump family like the Zuma and Gupta families in South Africa? Well, I have to be careful here, uh, John, on, on two fronts. One, there is a similarity that Trevor Noah and others have, have, have even joked seriously about between Zuma and, and Trump with regard to their banality and their self-dealing and the profit making that some of their closest advisors and cronies uh, have been guilty of, or so it's coming to light. But there's a deeper state capture issue in the U.S that relates to the increasing minority status of the Republican Party that over the last 40 years has championed a Southern strategy in alliance with Northern business interests. And that is now becoming a minority demographically as that's the white Christian um, uh, predominance of, of uh, ethnic group in the, in the US. And Trump has uh, un unbridled this, uh, this ethnic nationalist campaign and has won in 16, not by a popular vote, but in the Electoral College. And in the Electoral College, he managed to beat Hillary Clinton 304 to 277, but the weighting of that Electoral College is for the smaller states, for the Southern states. It's, the, the whole Electoral College process was rooted in the unholy bargain of 1789 that set up the Constitution with uh, waiting for African Americans that was uh, three-fifths of a vote but it gave the Southern states power over the federal government, and that's persisted. What this election is really about is whether or not the Republicans can pull off another electoral college win and in the process consolidate their control over the judiciary, the executive branch, and perhaps the Senate. They've lost the House of Representatives. So that, that's why this, this is an inflection point in that sense, John. That, that leads me very naturally to what, what Millard and I have been talking about. When, Millard, when you and I were in Washington in the 80s, African-American political power was still not really in the establishment, but now it is. Uh, uh, many African-Americans are in very senior positions in the Congress, and of course there are many uh, um, Af African-American mayors in, in major cities and, and are, you know, really first-class contributors to the political world. Um, how, how, how do you see the African-American impact in this election in 2020? John, uh, the role that African-American voters will play will be critical in the upcoming election. I'd like to endorse something John has said earlier. John um, mentioned uh, that this is a, an election that goes back in many ways to uh, the historical role that uh, the Electoral College has played and the role that white voters have played in electing presidents. Why this is important is that no American, no Democratic president has not, has won the, uh, the white vote in the last 40 years. Um, they have never won a white vote. If Democrats are to win an election, they have to win it with black votes. 
Uh, Clinton did not win with white votes. He did not have uh, the majority of white votes. Carter did not have the majority of white votes. Obama did not have the majority of white votes. If, if, um, if Joe Biden is to win this election, it will have to be with the assistance and the voting presence of black Americans. Um, and if you look at the elections that took place in 2016, the turnout by black Americans was such that it provided a, a margin of victory to Obama. Uh, to 20, I'm sorry, 2012 gave a margin of victory to Obama. Had that same number of votes uh, of voter turnout been present in 2016, black Americans would have given um, the election to Hillary Clinton. As a small example, I mean, I, I found this fascinating. In Florida, a state with 29 electoral votes, Trump won by just 113,000 votes. Blacks who did not vote statewide were 1.4 million. If we look at Georgia, 16 electoral votes, Trump won by just 211,000 votes. Blacks who did not vote statewide were 898,000. I could go through the next six swing states, and in each instance, you would see that had Blacks voted in the same proportion they voted in 2012, Hillary Clinton would have won the election. That figure was predicated now, we look at, uh, when we look at uh, the figures for 2020, and realize that it's unlikely that Trump is going to do better than he did the last time out. When he ran in 2016, no one knew what he stood for. No one had any idea who Donald Trump was. This is going to be a referendum on Donald Trump. It doesn't matter about Joe Biden. It's a referendum on Donald Trump and his character. Why he chose, and, and I think it's important in terms of the strategy of the Democrats, to have chosen uh, Kamala Harris to run with him is to uh, solidify the black vote. Black women voters represent 16 million. And to put her on the ticket uh, gives uh, Black Americans a chance to understand that at the, t at the head of the Democratic Party ticket is a Black American. And that, I think, is the critical strategy going forward. Um, blacks will be the determining factor in this election. Um, Milord, we, we have to go to a break in a minute. But before we do, I want to ask you, do you think it's going to happen this time? I mean, will they get those hundreds of thousands in Georgia and the other places with Kamala Harris on the ticket, with the heightened uh, uh, stresses around Trump as president? Do you think that the, the African-American vote is going to come in much higher than it did in 2016? I do. I, I do, John. And I'll give you one small thing that no one perhaps out here would be aware of, but in the States it's very important. The NFL, the National Football League, and the National Basketball Association have been running major get out the vote campaigns. Wow. What is their constituency? Their constituency is primarily black Americans. Uh, black Americans constitute somewhere between 80 to 90% of the professional athletes in those two sports. By every single game, every single broadcast, they are talking about getting out the vote. So one of the, one of the uh, toss away lines is, you can't win if you don't play. That's being played out constantly to the African Americans. I think the turnout will be very high. It'll be something very close to the turnout that we saw in 2012 with, with Obama. It'll be somewhere close to 70%. That's, that's fascinating. And, and in fact, of course, I was looking up uh, the NFL and the others. They're, they're, those sporting uh, codes are extremely popular among the broad American population. They are indeed, yes. We're going to have to uh, take a break, but we'll be right back. Welcome back. Um, Millard, I want to uh, just pursue another question with you, and that is the flip side of that. We've got the African-American population growing and very motivated and, and uh, in your opinion, likely to really deliver the numbers and make the difference this time. Um, are you worried also about the flip side, the white militias? These, I mean, I guess they're white supremacists that are taking to the streets and might even take to the streets on election night. 
Well, I am worried. I think anyone who has seen the uh, buildup of militia around the country would be worried, both black and white. But my greater concern is this. Um, I think that uh, Trump and his constituents are trying to prepare the grounds for a belief that he did not win the election fairly. Um, because their starting point is, well, you know, um, voting from abroad is going to lead to fraud. Anyone voting by mail will lead to fraud. The assumption being, we would win this election were it not for those votes. So if the election turns out to be wi widely in Biden's favor, there will be the perception that obviously there was fraud involved here because Trump would have won, won this election but for the fraud. And that will give impetus to this kind of militancy that we're looking at. So I'm deeply concerned about not so much the election night, but on the night in which the results are made known uh, that we will begin to see this kind of violent reaction on the belief that he was cheated out of the election. And if we go back to 2016, this is interesting because all of the intelligence agencies, I think all 16 have said that the Russians interfered in the elections. If they interfered in the elections, then how then would it be possible for Trump to win this time around, but for the fact that it was fraud? Right. Um, uh, now, John, the flip side of that uh, argument is, is, that, that, uh, uh, that Mar Millard's been making, is, which is that uh, uh, Biden has the upper hand where if the African-Americans come out to vote, is that we're going to see a lot of October surprises. You know, the whole idea that in October is when uh, presidential candidates have or are given surprises that change things. It looks like we're going to have a lot of them this time, John. I, um, what's your sense of that? I mean, it seems like uh, uh, Trump is trying to squeeze out uh, uh, an end to the war in Afghanistan. He's signing these de deals in the Middle East. What, do you, what kind of, uh, and, and he's almost certain to declare a victory in the fight for a vaccine, wh whether there is a vaccine or not. Well, John, um, Millard has talked about the turnout, and I think that's going to be crucial. But he's also warned about the, um, the, 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 the way that Trump might play the electoral night in the counting process. And there are a lot of suspicious actions already being underway so that Biden is going to have to win big. Biden wouldn't have a chance to win as big as he's going to win if it wasn't for the COVID-19 pandemic that Trump has so badly handled plus the economic crisis, both of which have, of course, redounded to the pain and, and suffering of African-Americans and frontline workers and Hispanics. But one wants to remember that in the 16 election, it was only 70,000 votes in three states that really shifted that swing to Hillary Clinton. And so there's going to be a lot of very close inspection over the repression of votes and how they've been handled in each of these key states. But Biden has to win big, and he has to win big enough to get a Senate majority, too, to, in order to, to govern effectively. That will open up lots of opportunities for South Africa and for African-U.S. relations, it seems to me, and I've argued before, as you know. But um, if we don't get this election pulled off in a credible way that can amp down the kinds of concerns that, that Millard was raising, there could be a constitutional crisis. And, and that would be a terrible development, not only for the United States, but for democracy writ large. I mean, Nalandi Pandor last night in the national address that she gave at the Witt School of Governance uh, really outlined the changing international environment that confronts South Africa. In her second sentence, she talked about the US in, in, in sort of in challenge to the United Nations. And, and that is the, the multi, multipolar world being challenged by a unilateralist, a nationalist unilateralist, Donald Trump. But Donald Trump knows nothing about uh, international affairs. He has no strategy and he has no strategists. This has been an improvised administration that has depended on one man and he is woefully unqualified to handle these complexities. I think, John, that the reason he downplayed the uh, coronavirus uh, and when it first broke out was not only he was distracted with other things, it was he wouldn't know how to govern in a complex situation where you have to rely on scientists the way 
Cyril Ramaphosa has here and formulate a national strategy that you can then build on to try to contain the virus. He just didn't know how to st start it. He's a reality TV guy. So as a result, we have got a situation where I think the American voters are fed up, but we'll have to see in terms of how it plays out in particular states. And as Millard said, it may not be over on November 3rd. John, uh, you have uh, had some insight into what might happen in terms of South Africa relations should Biden win. Uh, I think you've ha had some contact with Susan Rice, who many people assume would be the Secretary of State if Biden wins. What's your take and what, what does it mean for us? Well, you know, in many ways, the relationship between the United States and South Africa is so complex and intertwined historically with race relations and white supremacy issues that I think there would be a wonderful opportunity to clear the air with a Biden-Harris a a, a administration in ways that would at least allow for a serious discourse, a serious conversation between the two nations. Both leaders, Cyril Ramaphosa and uh, Joe Biden, who have lots of similarities in terms of their character and compassion and, and, and seriousness and respect for science, that they could at least um, create an atmosphere, but they're both very, very severely constrained by economic uh, issues, although the United States is far richer. So I would hope that there could be some creative ways to broaden and deepen the societal engagement of our two countries that have so much to learn from one another, including, I like to say, reforming the US Constitution so that it's more in sync with what uh, the South African Constitution does for having um, chapter nine independent institutions and get rid of the electoral college. But that's my dreaming, John, in the near term, the near term, just to get a, a, um, a, a reestablishment of the strategic partnership that existed under uh, Bill Clinton and um, when Ballard was in government then, and, uh, and uh, uh, Nelson Mandela and then Thabo and Becky before the Iran uh, Iraq war came and all the other problems. Right. Um, Millard, I want to do, come back to you. Uh, you're in a unique position to, you know, your, your uh, work on Steve Biko and black consciousness in South Africa and your knowledge of uh, uh, the United States. Do you see a relevance to Black Lives Matter in South Africa? How do you see that interrelationship? Um. Look, the issue of Black Lives Matter is something John touched on a moment ago in terms of the fact that America's relationship with South Africa has been complex and it has been multifaceted on a range of issues. Many of the matters that we have seen in South Africa were reflected in American politics. and Much of what we've seen in the United States has been reflected in South Africa. You can look at uh, what was our homeland's policy here in South Africa and equate that to the way in which Native Americans were de dealt with in terms of reservations. You can talk about any number of, of, of laws that were enacted here in South Africa, which have a, a re that resonate as well in the United States. And indeed, during many of my uh, earlier, act, uh, earlier activities and involvement with white South Africans, many would argue, but we don't understand the position of the United States because we're doing exactly what you're doing. And we can't understand why you're now criticizing us for the very behavior that you yourselves are exhibiting. So do Black Lives Matter? Yes, because Black Lives Matter is a bigger issue than just what's going on in the United States. One of the big problems I think that we've had is we've tried to compartmentalize issues of racism so that they seem to be just a question of what's going on in the United States. What's happening here historically in South Africa just seems to be about apartheid. What's happened in the UK seems to be something that's going on in the UK. Rarely do we link all of these issues together to say that they all reflect a concern that black people have about their dignity, about their, the, the way in which they're treated, and about basic, understandable, universal human rights. So do black lives matter? Sure they matter. They matter here in South Africa because despite a black government and despite the enormous um, advances that have been made, uh, since the elections in 94, there still remains pockets of racism, pockets of discrimination, which impact black lives here, just as they do in the United States. And until black people worldwide, globally, 
feel that they are being treated with the dignity that every human being deserves, black lives will always matter. Thank you, um, uh, Millard and, and John. I, I wish we could carry on, but I'm, I, I'm going to be asking you both to come back uh, very soon, perhaps next week, if you're both available. Uh, but thanks so much for doing this, uh, and thank you for watching at home. I look forward to carrying on the discussion uh, ab about what we really do need to, our politicians to do differently so we can get South Africa back on track and to following the, imp uh, the connections we, we see. Uh, to international trends, especially what's going on in this extraordinary election in America. I'm John Madison. I hope to have you back with me again next week.